When Jesus' first followers encountered him alive again after his death, could these encounters have been visions or mystical experiences? Against this, there's the evidence that his tomb was empty. His body really had gone. But in recent years, it's been claimed that the story of the empty tomb was made up more than 30 years after the event, perhaps by the author of Mark's Gospel. The word resurrection doesn't mean John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Um, they had other language for talking about that. Resurrection has to do with bodies. The Greek word anastasis, standing up again, means that a body that has been flat stands up. Or they talk about sleeping and waking. Somebody has been, as it were, asleep, and now they're awake, alive again. I think one of the main things here is that we have some early church preaching that is way earlier than Mark. Now, uh, even say John Dominic Cross and Marcus Borg, both of them say they're open to the suggestion that Paul may have implied the empty tomb in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Paul says, I gave you, and this is pre-Pauline material, this, this is the material that I was talking about that can be dated back to 30 to 35. Paul says, repeating this material, I gave you what I was given as a first importance, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Now if you think about th th this process, okay, Jesus is on the cross, he dies, he's buried, he rises. What does that sequence mean? It means that what goes down is what comes up. In fact, the word that's used in the Greek New Testament is anastasis, and uh, Tom Wright of St. Andrews University has done more work on this than anybody. He's got basically 550 of a 750 page book as a word study on the Greek words anastasis and Igeru. And he argues that no matter who used the words for resurrection, pagan, Jewish, or Christian, no matter who used anastasis and Igeru, they were always or almost always only referring to a body. So if you're referring to a body and you say died, buried, raised, appeared, you're saying what goes down is what comes up. And so that report in Paul, again, goes back to the early 30s. It's, it's way before Mark had a dream about writing. Some people have tried to say that the empty tomb is a later development in Christian theology. But the discovery that I mentioned earlier, that in the 15th chapter of his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul is quoting from an early tradition that he himself received not in his own hand, I think suggests that this is, is quite incorrect. When you look at this four-line formula, he died, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. That is like an outline of the gospel passion narrative on the one hand and the preaching in the book of Acts, the early apostolic sermons on the other hand. And when you look at what corresponds to that third line, and he was raised, it is the story of the empty tomb. This is a summary and outline form of the empty tomb narrative, where Paul's expression, and he was raised, mirrors the angel's words, he is risen. So we have, I think, in Paul a, an outline of the earliest proclamation of the uh, disciples, the belief of the church in Jerusalem that goes right back to within the first years after Jesus' crucifixion. Paul doesn't mention the empty tomb, but he wouldn't need to. It's kind of like today, if a, um, a baby dies of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, we don't have to talk about an empty crib. It's assumed. Mark is not writing uh, in his own hand either. Mark is using a source for his passion narrative that is called the pre-Markan passion narrative. And this also ends with the burial and the discovery of the empty tomb. And scholars have dated this pre-Markan passion source to come also within just several years after Jesus' death uh, and to be based upon eyewitness testimony. So some of the earliest sources that we have in the New Testament, uh, I think, are quite supportive of the fact of the empty tomb. And this is one reason that the majority of New Testament historians today have come to acknowledge the fact of the empty tomb of Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 
he not only talks about the resurrection and says, uh, whether it's the apostles or me, this is what we're preaching. He goes on and he says in verse 20, Christ is the first fruits of the dead. In verse 23, the rest of us are going to be resurrected at Jesus' coming. So the way we are going to be raised is the way Jesus was raised. And what's really interesting, uh, Paul elsewhere is going to talk about in, at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, he says Christ is going to bring back with him those um, who have died as Christians uh, prior to a second coming. But he says then he's going to raise them from the dead. Well, what do you mean he's going to raise them from the dead if he's bringing them back with him? Well, he brings their spirits. When we die, our spirit leaves our body and goes to be with Christ. When he returns, he brings back our spirits with him puts our spirits back in our corpses, which he then resurrects and then transforms into this immortal, glorious, powerful body that's animated or empowered by the Holy Spirit. So it's a bodily resurrection that we're going to be experiencing um, when Jesus returns. And the way we are raised is the way Jesus was raised because he's the first fruits. So it's a bodily resurrection. And so we can see the earliest uh, apostles were preaching the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And of course, if you've got a bodily resurrection, you've got an empty grave. When you think logically about the different bits of the early Christian claim, then you discover that they actually fit together, but it's one of those jigsaw puzzles which, if you take one bit away, the rest will disintegrate as well. So that if all you have is visions of Jesus for uh, a few days, a few weeks, some people seeing him, but then if his body is still in a tomb somewhere, then they would say, as we've said before, these are just those hallucinations, those experiences, it was his angel visiting us or whatever, and that proves not that he's alive, but precisely that he's dead. Equally, if you just had an empty tomb, if they discovered, even certifiably, that it really was Jesus' tomb, but it was empty, well, the ancient world is full of stories of grave robbery, especially when people are rich or famous or well-known or leaders, because people often assumed that if somebody was the leader of a movement, then chances are his followers might have buried some treasure with him. So if you go and snatch the body, you may find the treasure. And there's lots of novels and, and plays which include that motif in the, in the first century, actually, in the Greek world. So by itself, an empty tomb doesn't prove resurrection. By itself, sightings of Jesus doesn't prove resurrection. Put the two together, however, and they tell a totally new story. Now, for that reason, I do not believe what some scholars have, have suggested, that first you had empty tomb stories and only later you had um, appearance stories, or vice versa, that first you had appearance stories and only later you had empty tomb stories, because actually you wouldn't get the one without the other as meaning resurrection. By themselves, either half of that would simply mean this is a puzzle, this is a mystery, but he's clearly dead, and now what are we going to do? Um, but the now what are we going to do bit is the crucial thing. If they hadn't had that total picture that he really was alive again, they would not have even begun to do and say and think what clearly from very, very soon after Jesus' death, they did begin to do and say and think, which was not only to say, he's alive again, This world, the world is a very strange place, but actually to say he's alive again, and therefore God's new creation has begun, God's kingdom has truly been launched on earth as in heaven, the powers of evil have been defeated, and therefore we are going to go out into the world and tell people that God is God and that Jesus is Lord, and whatever they do to us, we're going to go on living by that and telling that story. In the ancient world, when someone said resurrection, they meant that someone's body had been raised, not just that their spirit lived on. And the claim that Jesus' tomb was empty began with the earliest stage of Christian testimony. It didn't wait until Mark's Gospel was written 30 years later. Maybe we could explain away the empty tomb in terms of grave robbers or a group of Jesus' followers taking the body, but that doesn't explain his appearances. Or maybe we could explain away the appearances in terms of mass hallucination, but this doesn't account for the empty tomb. Taken together, these are powerful historical evidence that Jesus really did rise from the dead. There's one more counterclaim that we need to think about. 
This is the claim that the accounts in the Bible of Jesus rising from the dead contradict each other. We'll explore this claim next time.